Aloha and welcome to the 10th annual I Teach 808 Empowering Hawaii's Teachers in Technology Conference, sponsored by the Augustine Educational Foundation and Sacred Hearts Academy Honolulu. My name is Sophie Chang and I'll be facilitating this session. We're so honored to have Lynn Nguyen join us today to share her expertise through a 90 minute presentation named 10 Developmentally Appropriate Strategies for Integrating Tech in the Virtual Classroom. Please be aware that we will be recording this session. If you don't like being recorded, you may consider turning your camera off during the session. The recording will be made available on YouTube and shared on iTeach808's website a week after this event. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lynn. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Lynn Nguyen, and like Sophie said, I will be presenting on developmentally appropriate skills for integrating technology in the virtual classroom. Um, so I guess I'll introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I graduated in Hawaii from UH Manoa with my BS in biology. Um, and from there, I actually am more involved in social work right now. So I work at Parents and Children Together and also um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Hawaii. But for my business, I do Fruition's eTutoring, which is an online tutoring company for math, sciences, and reading and test prep. So that's how I kind of got involved in the teaching aspect of everything. Um, I've been tutoring since I was 16 years old with the Kumon Math and Reading Center. And then from there, um, all throughout college, I was tutoring as well. And then um, I guess I just got used to tutoring. And so I kind of started to get more students or more individuals who were interested in um, getting tutoring services. So that's how I came up with Fruition's e-tutoring. Um, so everything is done virtually and um, we use Zoom as our um, resource to interact with the students via screen sharing and all of that. So I'll go into the next slide now. So this next slide is just kind of like a content overview. So it's gonna be a little bit, kind of like an agenda of what we're gonna be going over today. So there's gonna be the benefits of virtual or online learning. Um, there's gonna be ways to effectively integrate technology in the classroom using different applications, such as ThingLink, um, Canva, and so on. And then we're gonna talk about also gauging and tracking student engagement and their progress virtually as well. Um, in addition to that, we're going to talk about benefits from using technology in the classroom for both the students and educators. And finally, for the last part of our presentation, we're going to be talking about different resources like applications and tools that we can use, such as Canva, ThingLink, and then Jamboard. And Jamboard is actually kind of interesting because it's kind of tied into Google. So it's a function that Google has that allows students to kind of interact with each other virtually online. So any questions so far? All right, perfect. So if you go to the next slide, this is a chart, and this chart shows the weekly usage of digital content by middle school students during the 2018-2019 school year. So keep in mind that this is all before COVID. So of course, during COVID, a lot of things kind of switched to um, virtual learning, like over the course of 2020 to 2022. But before that, over 343,500 students, parents, teachers, and administrators from various schools throughout the U.S. were already using technology to kind of integrate that component into their classroom. So all of these people responded to the survey during the school year of 2018 to 2019. And as you can see here, they used technology for various things, virtual labs, online primary resources and documents, even animations and simulations, online textbooks, online or digital games, videos, or softwares and apps. And they break it down in this chart by different categories. So the blue line shows you the sixth through eighth grade students in urban schools. The orange bar shows you students in suburban schools. And then um, the green bar shows you students in rural schools. So you can kind of see a trend that um, the, rural, the more rural schools, they tend to have a higher number of students who are using technology in their classroom or a higher percentage. So if we jump into our presentation now, the first part is going to be a little bit more about e-learning and online courses. So of course, we know that colleges, some high schools um, have the op give students the option of doing their classes virtually or online. So we're gonna be talking a little bit more about how this changed throughout the COVID period and how it impacts and affects students in today's time.
Okay, so now we're going to go over the definitions of virtual classroom, online classes, and online learning. So online classes and online learning sounds kind of similar, but online classes is actually a little bit different from online learning. So we'll go over them one by one. So virtual classroom is basically any class that was originally scheduled as in-person and then later on moved to an online format. Online classes were classes that were originally intended to be online already. And then for online learning, that's education that takes place over the internet. And it's also referred to as e-learning or a type of distance learning. So here, if you look at this chart, you can see the different types or proportions of content that's delivered online. So there's traditional, web facilitated, blended or hybrid, and then completely online. So Here's a description of them. Traditional is a course where no online technology is used. So the content is only delivered in either writing or orally. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no technology that's used in the process of um, the educator teaching or informing the students in their classrooms. So they can use, you know, a whiteboard, a smart board, iPads, stuff like that. But Overall, the students are still going to the class in person and interacting with their peers and their educators in person as well. Next, we have web facilitated. So web facilitated is a course that uses web-based technology to facilitate what's technically like a face-to-face -face course. So kind of similar to what we're doing right here. And they may use a course management system or web pages to post the syllabus and assignments. So like Moodle, stuff like that, all of those are web facilitated. So they integrate the technology into their education system. And then thirdly, we have blended or hybrid. So these are courses that blends online and face-to-face -face delivery. And I think during COVID, this would be like the biggest portion of this type of education that was used during that time. So this is substantial proportion of the content is delivered online and it typically uses online discussions and has a reduced number of face-to-face -face meetings. So it's kind of like half is in-person and half might be online, for example, using apps like Zoom, Teams, and so forth. And lastly, we have completely online. And that's a course where most of all the con most or all of the content is delivered online or virtually. And there's barely or there's very minimal or no face-to-face -face meetings at all. So each type of course has its pros and benefits, and we'll be going over that a little bit more in this next slide coming up. Okay, so here are some of the pros and, con pros and cons of virtual or hybrid learning. Here, uh, I guess we'll go over the pros first. So the pros would be convenience of access. That means everything is accessible in one place. Students don't have to relocate themselves. There's no geographical constraints, which allows students from different areas, right? Not just different places in the community, but different states or different countries even as well. So this gives students and teachers uh, more flexibility to interconnect online and get their education that they need. Another pro is that they, the students learn new technical skills. Now the focus is on the students right here, but because of today's time and age, teachers or educators are also able to learn new technical skills as well. So they're being immersed in the technology that powers and drives online learning, and this enhances their technical literacy. So they'll be able to use more apps, get more familiar with different um, resources that are available online. And this exposes the students to different types of technology as well, which is a benefit for them. Now, thirdly, it also enhances communication skills, which is kind of like a pro and a con. So online classes or online learning creates opportunities for students to interact, participate and communicate with their peers and instructors in different ways. Now, this part is a little bit tricky because it really depends on what type of learner that student is. If they're more, if they perform better or if they learn better in a face-to-face -face environment, then this might be tricky for them. And it also depends on their time management skills, right? If students are more self-motivated or more self-driven or able to kind of navigate their own learning style, then this will enhance their communication skills. But it can also serve as a downfall. Students who aren't as comfortable with navigating things online, students who aren't able to self-motivate themselves to get to the steps or yeah, get to the steps that they need to take in order to um, get the education that they need, that might be kind of a little bit more of a challenge for them. So 
pro, but also a little bit of a con there. And then the fourth pro of online or virtual learning is that it boosts students' self-discipline. Again, this fourth pro kind of ties in with the third pro, which means that students will be required to develop skills needed to stay motivated and accountable despite learning from a distance, and they're able to set their own personal specific goals that leads to higher performance. But this is also kind of based on an individual basis. So if students are already self-disciplined, if they have the skills that they need to solve problems online, kind of like troubleshoot and everything, then it would be good for them. But if they're kind of a little bit more laid back, not too self-confident or don't have that discipline yet, then this could also be a downfall as well. But if we look at the cons right now of virtual or online learning, let's start with this first one right here. There's definitely going to be limited social interaction. So communication is limited through only screens if you're doing completely online learning. If you're doing hybrid, you kind of get a little bit of the best of both worlds, depending on how that uh, education is structured, right? But there would be a lack of face-to-face -face interaction with the instructors. And there would also be, aside from the instructor themselves, a lack of a campus atmosphere. So this can forfeit students' motivation and their engagement to learn. Another con would be course incompatibility. So the digital environment may not be the best for certain courses. So for example, anatomy, right? That's more hands-on. You can always apply um, the visuals and all of that information through an online course, but students might be able to, I guess, be more hands-on and look at the different layers of muscles or all of like the anatomy anatomical parts of the human body if they were to have that course in person. Um, the third con would be different student learning styles. There are different student learning styles. Some students learn better um, like auditory learners, visual learners, stuff like that. So some students might find it easier to lose focus and drift away if they are engaging in an online course or they might or there might be too many distractions at home for them. And then of course, the fourth con is increased screen time. So excessive screen time can lead to poor posture, headaches, bad vision, which is not listed here. It can also be a personal issue to students who struggle with learning or focusing on screens. And especially since the internet is geared to distract students with like social media, entertainment, right? Students can just pop open a different screen, open YouTube, watch YouTube. Students can pop open a different screen, play their games online and everything like that. So if they're not completely focused on their screen or on the content that the, that the educator is presenting, then they might be just a click away from the learning material. So of course there are distractions as well. So any questions on this portion so far? All right, so I know there was pros of online learning and there's also, there's also going to be cons. So we're gonna discuss now the best practices for teaching online. So there's 10 major focuses here. There's presence, community, expectations of students and educators, group, so the class as a whole, the mode, different activities that you do, feedback, by, um, back and forth between the students and the educators, discussion, resources, combinations, and planning. So first we'll talk a little bit about presence. So presence means to be present in your course. As an educator, of course you want, if you're doing an online course, right? You wanna be focused, present, and there with your students. That means limiting distractions, uh, asking the students if they have any questions about anything, making sure the students are attentive and following what you're saying so that um, they're not falling behind or anything like that. Just basically keeping in constant communication with your students to see where they're at in their progress. The second one is community. So this means creating a supportive online course community. Now this one's a tricky one because students, when they are learning online, a big percentage of them have given feedback to their instructors saying that the biggest struggle with online learning is that lack of ability to make connections with their fellow peers or even their educators. So community is a big thing that's usually lost in online learning. So being able to navigate that and kind of troubleshoot to deal with the different problems or issues that come up with that sense of lack of community that occurs online is going to be a big aspect to um, teaching online as well. Thirdly, you have expectations. 
So before your course even begins, you want to develop a set of explicit expectations for your students and for yourself as well. That's kind of like what you would want to do as an instructor to best engage your students, what you expect your students to do in that learning environment that would best serve them so they can learn to the best of their ability, even though it's virtual. Um, and also tying into the expectations, you want to encourage your students to not lose focus, not get distracted. You want to set kind of like the guidelines or the bar ahead of time so that students know that even though this is an online course, they're still expected to do the work, understand the information, and stay engaged in the curriculum that you're presenting. Fourthly, you have group. So this means using a variety of larger group or small group or individual work experience to kind of keep your students engaged and motivated throughout your curriculum. So the benefits of larger group is that students can share their ideas, collaborate with their peers, and get that sense of community that we were talking about earlier, right? Small group provides students with a little more private interaction with their peers and classmates, but still enables them to kind of interact with their peers, still share their ideas, and then receive ideas and information from their peers as well. And then, of course, there's individual work experiences, which is one-on-one -on -one work or independent work that the student does. So this is like homework, classwork, um, free time given in the classroom in order to in order for the students to kind of focus on the material that's being presented, right? And then fifth, we have mode. This is using both synchronous and asynchronous activities to again, engage your students. Now, number six is kind of a big highlight that's receiving and giving feedback. So asking for informal feedback throughout the term. So there's different types of feedback that you can give. Um, there's formal and informal. So formal would be more of something that's like a survey or a questionnaire for students to fill out. How are they liking the learning? What is working for them and what is not working for them? Informal feedback is more so like daily check-ins or weekly check-ins with the students. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What is confusing to you? What are you able to understand well? What are What is a little bit more challenging for you? Stuff like that. So based on that feedback, it's really important because the feedback that you give and receive to your students is going to help both of you folks um, have a more productive environment in your learning classroom. And then seventh, we have discussion. So preparing discussion posts that invite responses, discussions, and reflection. So discussion is really important and that kind of ties into number four, group two, right? Using larger groups, small groups, and individual work experiences to kind of engage your students in the learning material. So this is not only beneficial for students to engage with their peers, but it also allows for a little, it gives a little bit wiggle room for feedback as well. Students can talk about what's confusing them. So if you know that your students or a large number of your students are all confused about one thing, right? Then you might wanna kind of change up your curriculum to spend more time focusing on that one thing. If only one or two students are confused about something, then you can give those students individual attention and then ask them what's confusing for them, what issues they're having, and then troubleshoot and navigate from there. Number eight, resources. This is a little bit trickier for online learning because you have to find reliable online resources that your students are able to use. And you also have to make sure that it's compatible with the laptop, computer, whatever technology that they're using. So searching out and using resources that are available in digital format is really important. So PDFs, right, work well. And I know that on your Apple computer, they have pages, but on your Microsoft computer, they use Microsoft Word. So you have to make sure that all students, regardless of what technology they're using, hopefully it's the same type of technology, are going to be able to access those resources without too much difficulty to begin with. And then we have number nine, combinations. This is combining core concept learning with customized and personalized learning as well. So you do want to have like a backbone structure to whatever curriculum or materials that you are presenting to your students, but you also want to provide a little bit more wiggle room um, so that the students can have personalized learning as well. So each student learns differently like we talked about earlier, visual, auditory, more hands-on learning. So depending on the learning style of that student, you want to combine a different um, variety of resources so that it targets each student's specific learning styles if possible. 
And then lastly, we have number 10, which is planning, which kind of ties everything in all together, right? Planning a good closing and wrap activity for your course is really important. For planning, I would encourage having a lot of reflection. So either through written format, group reflection, small group or large group, or one-on-one -on -one reflection with the educator themselves. And the planning kind of ties into the feedback. <clears throat> so planning is basically getting the backbone structure of your curriculum together. That ties into feedback because based on that backbone structure, you want to be able to kind of, again, troubleshoot your class and um, be flexible with the students' schedules, the pace that they're learning at, the feedback that they're giving you in order to kind of better plan or change your planning if necessary. So any questions on these 10 best practices? All right, so now we have student progress tracking. So as we, as we discussed earlier, there's a lot of planning, resources, expectations, discussion, and feedback that goes into planning a curriculum or a lesson for your students, right? Um, but what's also important is the assessment part as well. So in this part of our presentation today, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about how to track student progress using assessments virtually. <laughs> So tracking student progress online, the more materials that you have, tests and assignments are distributed and submitted using classroom technology. So uh, Google Drive, students may submit their documents on there um, and other resources as well. The benefit of this is that it comes with the ability to monitor student progress at the touch and typing level. So um, one example of this, of course, is the Google document. In the Google document, both the educator and the student are able to get onto that document at the same time. So in our tutoring sessions, we often use Google Docs so that we can both work on the document at the same time. The educator can see what the student is working on, what their thinking process is like, right? Because they might be typing something and then, and then they might backspace and change what they're thinking. So you can see how the student progresses as they go through the lesson. You can also track which tasks or problem a student finds difficult. And you can do this by monitor monitoring the amount of time that a student spends on a problem, right? So how long they take. You also get intermediate or immediate results. And you can also gauge how many times the student has to start over. So this can be used to customize or target specific learning styles virtually. Is my student more of a virtual learner, an auditory learner, a more hands-on learner? Now, for the hands-on learner, it might be a little bit difficult to do online because, of course, you can't really do hands-on physical work online, right? But something that could work for the student might be engaging them in an activity online, a virtual game, a virtual resource. And then screen sharing will always help to um, work with that student because both the educator and the student can see what the student is working on and looking at at that moment. So here are some different progress tracking tools. One tool is Mastery Connect. This is a management platform that assists teachers in identifying student performance. And it, the benefit of this is that it provides mastery standards for any performance-based assessment. So whether you're quizzing them, giving them a test, giving them a lesson to work on, if you look here, it shows the name of the student, it shows you the lesson they're working on, and there's different functions that Mastery Connect has. So assess, view standards, you can even write notes to the students, give them specific resources that they can refer to if they're having difficulty. There's also a calendar, so setting deadlines for students. Um, you can also provide a sample of work that the students can refer to. And of course, you can monitor their grade and their performance. And at the very end, based on all of the different criteria that is listed in Mastery Connect, you can select if they are mastering the material, if they need more practice, if they're proficient, or if they need more practice. So with Mastery Connect, the unique tools of this program are, it tracks data, there's performance assessment, there's teacher comparison analysis, and there's common performance sharing. And the good thing about this tool is that it's free for verified teachers and admin as well. Um, any questions? Do you folks want to take a look at Mastery Connect? Yes. Um, for Mastery Connect, do you 
create the assessments in the actual platform or is it like linked to something else? Um, it's both. So you can connect or you can create the assessment via this online platform or you can make your own and upload to this website as well. Were those would those be like like is like multiple choice assessments or how does it how does it um, do the self grading? Yes. So a multiple choice assessment would be for the function that's already programmed into Mastery Connect. If you're choosing to like upload your own material for assessment, then it can be whatever you like. And they do have a function too, where you can create your own assessment online and then bring that into Mastery Connect as well, which is this portion right here. Okay, did that help or did I confuse you a little bit more? <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so another progress tracking tool that you can use is Schoolology. So this is also web-based and it's a management system that helps to create courses and easy data management. So as you can see here, this is a little bit different from the last one because it uses more of a rubric format. So there's a four for excellent, three good, two satisfactory, and one needs improvement. Um, the, interesting about, the interesting thing about Schoolology is you can actually edit these scales to customize it to the type of lingo or vocabulary that you wanna specifically use. So instead of using excellent, good, satisfactory, or needs improvement, you can edit it to include things like meets proficiency, exceeds proficiency, uh, needs improvement, and so forth. So this one is unique because it has an online grade book. So you can actually, students can upload their work and you can actually grade it online. There's a calendar, attendance tracker, uh, you can create assignments online as well, assessments, discussions, which focuses on focuses on that back and forth student and educator interaction, right? Student progress and time management because they also have a calendar feature in there. This app is also free to educators in kindergarten to 12 public and private schools, colleges and universities worldwide. The third progress tracking tool that we're going to go over is Goal Formative. This one I really like because it's an assessment tool that provides real-time interventions to help teachers take immediate action. So when students finish an assignment, they can uh, teachers can see that on here. It also tracks the time that students spend on each problem, each assignment. And so the features of this one are assignments, tracking student progress, student engagement, live feedback so students, uh, educators can comment as students are doing their own work. You're also able to upload resources that you think would be beneficial to the students and it has actionable insights. So if we zoom in a little bit on this, here you can see that you can edit the amount of time of work that you can see for each student. So in this example, they're showing the work that the students did within the last 14 days. On the left-hand column, it shows you each individual. Here are the assignments, and it tells you the scores for each of these students. The good thing about this program is that it, is that it also shows you the summary or average of all the students' work. So if you have a 74% overall, that means that students are understanding or comprehending about 74% of the material that you're teaching. And you're also able to filter, sort by, or export. So you can actually take all of this information, customize it to the amount of time that you want to view the student's work, and then export that so you can have it as your own file in an Excel or PDF format. So any questions on Goal Formative? This one's a little bit trickier because it is free, at the bronze level. However, if you want more unique functions, you would have to pay, but you can also, um, like I said, have more functions to be able to engage and interact with your students more online and upload assignments as well. Okay. So now we're going to jump into tech-enabled student presentations. Sorry, Lynn, um, how much does it cost? So, uh, I want to go the um, Schoolology. Or, oh, Schoolology is a free form, uh, pre, pre program, Ms. O'Shara. 
Oh, uh, is it free? Yes. What? Oh, yes. wow. Like so, unlimited uh, students. Yes, unlimited students, and you're able to use all the formats that they offer too. And they have resources, community support. Um, they have um, a specific tracker for um, tracking better student outcomes, uh, educator effectiveness, operational readiness, um, success stories, all that sort of stuff. Oh, oh, I see what you said. Free to educators in K-12 to at the bottom of your... Sorry, I missed that part. That's amazing. Okay, that's super cool. It's so organized, like easy to read, very user-friendly looking. We're going to... I'm going to show that to my admin. Thank you. No worries. I'm gonna, I can screen share it with you real fast too. So this is what the application looks like. And then if you scroll down, you can see that you can even watch a demo of what the program is like. And then... There's different categories, their products. So they have all of this available. And they even have risk analysis, which I really like because that kind of helps you to see where the students are struggling, how you can better navigate to help those students who are struggling online. And they have employee records, behavior support, performance matters, and yeah. Do you know which schools use it? currently um in hawaii or any of the schools that use it i'm not too sure which schools on island use it but i know that in california a lot of their schools or a lot of their universities use it for their online classes oh, i see oh thank you so much no problem so yeah technically the first two that we talked about the master connect and the schoolology is free for educators as long as you put in your credentials and everything and they verify you as an official educator. Um, this one is the only one that would require payment, but at the bronze level, it's still free for educators. Okay. So now tech enabled student presentations. So what is it? So students use technology to both create and present their final work. And later on in the presentation, I'll be going over a little bit more about what sorts of apps, students are able to use, what benefits it has, how it can be applied to different areas of students' learning. And so the good thing about tech-enabled presentations is that it encourages real-life applications of software and hardware in research and execution. So students can have a chance to gain familiarity and comfort with using tech in all aspects of their work. And this puts um, their practical skills into use instead of theoretically. So it's useful because they're able to do hands-on learning and they're able to kind of learn how to navigate these programs and apps by themselves as well. So tech-enabled student presentations, these are the three benefits of them. So one, it promotes collaboration and interactivity. So technology has a unique ability to collaborate live on a task or project and to share information with peers more efficiently. And this is particularly beneficial in group projects. So small groups and large groups, students can work on the same thing um, at the same time and looking at the same screen. It can also be applied in many different areas. So skills developed from creating online presentations can be transferred to other practical areas such as increasing knowledge of how to use graphics or diagrams effectively. And then the best thing about it is students are able to revisit their content. So many applications used for online or tech-based presentations include a recording feature. And this saves the presentation as a video file. So even if let's say a student is absent for a day, right? They can go back and they can watch that whole entire presentation as long as it's recorded and get all the information that, was, that they missed while they were out sick or something. So any questions about these three benefits? Okay. Now we're going to get into kind of the more hands-on portion of the presentation. So we'll be talking about resources for educators. So we're gonna talk about Google Classroom, Jamboard, Canva, and ThingLink. So the first one is Jamboard, and this one is a digital interactive whiteboard that was developed by Google. So what is Jamboard? A digital interactive whiteboard. And this allows students and teachers to collab collaborate in real time. So the different or the unique features that it has is writing, drawing, laser, adding images, text boxes, or sticky notes for feedbacks and comments. So when you open Jamboard, this is what it looks like. It's completely blank. 
And on the left-hand side, there's different functions that the students can use. So it's called Jamboard, but I like to think of it more of, mm, more of like a virtual collaborative online whiteboard. So students can write on this at the same time and they can present their work or ideas or show their work, right? In the same time period. So I'm gonna open that up real fast. And then screen share this application with you folks as a mini demonstration. All right, here we go. Sorry, it's loading a little bit more slowly. When you first open it, it looks totally blank. And on the left-hand side, there's different features, pens, erasers, pointer, sticky notes, adding images, shapes, and there's a laser. So if you're, if students are collaborating on something and they want to kind of point out their work, instead of using their mouth, they can use this laser to kind of point the attention of other students to what they're working on right there in that moment. So let's say we're doing a math problem like, Oops, like three X. I'll try three. Ah, I apologize, it's lagging a little bit right now. Let me try refresh it. Okay, so three X plus two. Normally it's not this laggy. I think it might be my computer because I have a lot of different applications open. But if you have a problem like 3x plus 2 equals 10, for example, then students can write on here and then they can share this document too. And then the other students that are able to access the document on the Jamboard are able to see in live time what the other folks are writing as well. And together, especially if it's a collaborative math problem or word problem, then the students are able to show their work or even help each other, right? To figure out the different steps that are needed to solve the equation. So that's one benefit of Jamboard. Another thing that's beneficial is you can write sticky notes. So for example, you could write, um, to solve this, you subtract two from both sides and you would save it. And so even if students aren't on the same document at the same time, uh, they can still look at it because the Jamboard saves the student's progress. And then if other students hop on, they're able to maybe make sticky notes about anything that's still confusing to them, anything that they still have questions about. And from there, the students, the other students can go back on and resolve the sticky note or put an answer to it. So any questions about this application here? Yes. Um, in my experience with Jamboard, it's been the same thing where it is like very laggy. Um, it wasn't as bad as that, but I do, I do think that like, you know, when they when they use it, I've found that that is like kind of frustrating for the students because then like they aren't able to do what they need to do or if they have like, you know, a computer screen trying to like do all the motions with their trackpad is harder. Um, yeah. I teach math, so I'm doing things like that, you know, where they're writing out um, equations or the work. Do you know of other like collaborative whiteboard spaces? Yes, and we're gonna be going over those like the, the next few ones. Okay, perfect. So give me one second, let me bring that up too. So this is not included in the presentation, but there is this app called Web Whiteboard. Have you heard of that before, Sophie? I've not. The only whiteboard ones that I use um, are like Desmos or the uh, whiteboard Fi, which like for those ones, they aren't collaborative, but I can like have something already pre-made and then like share the whiteboard with them and then students can work on it individually. Okay. 
So I'm bringing up this one app right now. It's called Web Whiteboard. And then let me screen share it with you. So it's also a free app and it's basically the same function as Jamboard. Let's see. Oh yeah, this one works much better actually. So for example, if you have two X plus five equals nine, then students can solve their work and you can also save it and share it. And different students, depending on what they're working on, they can also, um, what is it? Have the sticky note function to add notes as well. This one's a tiny bit different because you type it on the screen. So students can see you typing in real time too. Subtract five from both sides, something like that. Right. So this one is one that can also be like combined. It seems like it can work with Google, like Gmail, Google Classroom accounts and everything. Yes. And then it would save on the Google Drive as long as you sign in. Okay. And then this one's a little bit different too because you can also just type text onto here. So if you are presenting to your students, you can type, for example, like, please solve this problem or something like that. And then students can work and see you as you're writing the problems down. And it's also interactive. So multiple people can be on the same document at the same time. Okay. Any questions about this app, Sophie? I have another question. Um, so I know like Jamboard can have like multiple screens, right? You can like make like kind of a, like if you wanted to do like different problems on each screen, you could do that and give them a whole set. Does that have that, this feature like where you can add like another whiteboard? Okay, yeah. So pros and cons, good to know both. Thank you, Lynn. Lag, but yeah, there's some functions that Jamboard has that this one doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So that would be the whiteboard part. So let's jump back to this one. All right, and next we have Canva. And I'm sure both of you have heard about Canva before, but it's a graphic design platform and students can not only create um, like um, different flyers and everything, but they're also able to create videos, timelines, presentations, slideshows, logos, and all of that on Canva. So they can incorporate visual effects, photos, videos, or music into their work as well. So I'm gonna show you just some pictures first or some screenshots so they can make mind maps on Canva, different types of diagrams or flow charts as well, or timelines. And then um, they also have an idea board function that's good for brainstorming or collaborative projects. So have you got folks use Canva before in the classroom environment? Um, I haven't used it as much in like the actual or like with my lessons, but I've used it to just make other like resources, slideshows or worksheets or things like that. Perfect. So I'm gonna log in right here. So here's Canva. And so over here, you can create a design, so document, whiteboard, infographic, which is kind of like the basic stuff, but you can also do presentations, websites, and if you click more, they even have graphs, book covers. Let me see, what were we talking about earlier? Timelines, right? You can search timelines. And the cool thing about Canva is it comes with different types of formats already available to the students. So they can just tweak it or edit it however they want according to whatever projects that they're working on. So different types of timelines, organizational charts, and they have um, idea boards as well. So like flow charts. The thing about Canva is that some features of it require you to have Canva Pro, which is which you have to pay for. But they do have basic templates available that students can still use for free if they want. And then 
flow chart. So this would be free. Different diagrams that show different organizational structures. You can even do like a step-by-step -step diagram. So it shows you like step one. So maybe if you're creating a lesson plan or something for your students, you can go ahead and insert the different steps that they need to take in order to complete their project here. Diagrams, concept maps, pie charts, and all of the ones that I'm clicking on are free too. So that's really good. Styling your designing or styling your thinking process. One, two, three, four, five. So I think Canva is especially good for collaborative group projects, either small group or large group. And they have all these functions available and you can even make videos on them and PowerPoints as well. So if we click on presentations, they have different formats for phone and for your laptop. They have whiteboards. and documents as well. So if we take a look at, for example, this one right here. Students can use Canva kind of like as a creative outlet in a way to kind of customize, edit, and design their own projects. The good thing about Canva is that it comes with a template. The downside of it is that it almost, um, in a way encourages students to kind of just write their own thing in here using the format, right? So they might copy this format and use background, goals, objective and scope deliverables, which is a pro and con because they're being exposed to different formats and different ways of making their templates and designing their ideas and organizing it. But the downside would be if all the students use the exact same format, then it might be a little bit redundant. And then let's jump over to the video feature. So I really like this because they create videos, like we said earlier, right? Different students might have different types of technology, like an Apple laptop, a Mac uh, or a Dell laptop. So because of these types of different formats here, it allows the video that the students make to be specifically designed to fit the type of content or format that the students are working on. And there's also documents. And yeah. So any questions about the Canva? Oh, and just aside from all those different things that we talked about too, infographics can be made as well. So students are trying to, let's say a student is in a club or something and they need to create something that is going to advertise the club or something that's going to showcase what they've learned or like a final presentation. They can use these infographics to kind of condense and summarize the different ideas that they've picked up throughout the course of the curriculum. So any questions on that part before we jump to the next portion? So I'm gonna share screen again. So yeah, engaging presentations, brainstorming or collaborative projects. And with Canva, I forgot to mention earlier that similar to the Jamboard, different students can hop on at the same time too and kind of put their ideas down and work on it collaboratively, which is the plus. All right, so the next thing is ThingLink. Have you folks heard of ThingLink before? Um, I haven't until these presentations. Presentations. <laughs> so, like, yes. So ThingLink is interesting because it's a popular, useful, and a very cost-effective tool. So similar to Canva, there's a free version and a version that you have to pay for. But the good thing about ThingLink is if you pay for it one time, then all the students would be able to have access to it if they jump on that specific account. And so it allows for digital field trips so students can almost like, showcase their, the information that they've learned by creating almost like an interactive video with it. 
So they can take, for example, a photo of a local newspaper and then at add hotspots with opinions or additional information. They can pinpoint different things on their map. And this next slide shows the different types of features that ThingLink has that students can use to create or customize their own work. So there's a blank canvas, they can add images to it. There's a 360 function. So if students click down and move their mouse left and right, they can kind of reposition the screen to navigate to where they want to go. They can, there's a showroom and gallery to showcase their work. You can even link Google Maps to it, infographic, floor plan, and so forth. And so let me jump on to ThingLink really quickly. And let me share my screen. Okay, so this is ThingLink. And you have to create a login for it. But if you click on create, this is what we were looking at earlier, the different types of um, different types of, I guess, functions that it has that students can use to engage other students and educators in the projects or different materials that they come up with for their project. So if we start with a blank canvas, you can drop files in here. And you can upload it either from your Google Drive, OneDrive. You can even link it with the Canva account, which is a useful function of ThingLink too. There is also a 360 image or virtual tour. So if you watch this, which we won't watch it, but. Yeah, I love such as their school or they maybe haven't been there before. And here's a school community with a virtual tour to show people the direction of travel, taking in mind the new COVID restrictions. So capturing your- Yeah, so like you saw earlier, you can kind of move it around your images and create almost like a virtual tour or a virtual map. So students can use that for different projects that they make. They can insert different um, icons into their presentation. So if other students click on it, it'll redirect them to another section of ThingLink. So for this portion of the presentation, I wanted to see if you folks could hop onto ThingLink and kind of navigate it and see if you can create something like a miniature, maybe we'll spend seven minutes on it and see if you folks can come up with your own type of creation and then share it with the other people who are here in this session. So I'll give you folks seven minutes for that. And then let me know if you have any questions about anything. So the website would be thinglink.com. And when you get to that, it might ask you to sign in or to make an account, but you would begin by creating or by clicking create. And it will show all the different things here. So I'll give you folks about seven minutes for that. And then after the seven minutes is over, let me know if you have any questions, any feedback, or how you feel about ThingLink.
All right. So how's everything going so far? Um, good. I have logged in and I'm just looking at the options. Um, yeah, for everything. And I was going to try to do something with my Google Classroom. Well, I have, I do have this, which is some examples of different types of projects that students can use ThingLink for. So if we open this one up, you can even use it for all different types of subjects too, which is something that I really like about ThingLink. So for example, here's the quadratic formula, right? So students can add different types of tabs with different links leading to different other resources that their classmates can click on. So here's a video, an extra resource, equations, They can even type in a little bit more info if they don't want to put everything onto the main piece that they have or their main content on their poster. So this is the definition of a tornado. Students can get creative too by kind of building or designing their own shapes and everything and adding separate links to that as well. So it's very interactive as you can see. Indoor, outdoor. And here's that newspaper example that we were talking about. So this gives you information about the author. You can insert links in it, images, graphs, statistics. videos. So it's really appropriate for all different types of subjects, which is a nice thing about ThingLink. So I'm going to drop this website into your folks' uh, Zoom chat so you can access that as well. And here are some other examples of student work. So for anatomy, it's really good because students can interact literally online and then you can pinpoint the exact um, place in the human body where it's referring to, right? Videos, even images, diagrams, information. US history. So ThingLink, I think, is especially good for student projects because it allows students to share with their other classmates and it's very interactive too. So for food chain. And the thing about ThingLink that's cool is that you're able to kind of integrate other apps into it. So you can integrate Canva into it or like a Google document into it as well. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation, but I'll also share this link with you folks. So both of these sites, they really showcase student work. And so I'll give you a few minutes to kind of navigate and explore on your own. So maybe another two to three minutes.
Oh, um, would you be able to give us a quick tour of those websites for the ones who are watching the recording? Oh, yes, yes. I apologize. Thank you so much. They, so let me jump on it again. So here's the last website. Okay, so when you go to the website, it, this all pops up. So you're able to click on the different uh, examples of student work and then see how each student kind of used the ThingLink app to create their project. And it's all different subjects. So they have maybe a campus tour, forest food chain, um, human body anatomy, and other subjects as well. And let me jump to the other website. Oh, sorry, I, I, I think I missed it. So the, the K-12 technology uh, Weebly, is that for, for the DOE or who does who made it that website? So cool. It's like Oh, this website is just an example of student work. So I'm not quite exactly sure what school it's from, but it's just um, student work that has been based off of using the app ThingLink. Wow, that's amazing. I keep hearing ThingLink, ThingLink, like everybody keeps talking about it, but it's, yeah, it's so cool. But like, it seems like there's limitless possibilities. Yes, yes. And you can even create like a classroom homepage on it, like a mini website of some sort. So you can click course topics and it'll tell you the different types of topics that are listed. And then students can check their grades too on different links that are inserted into thing like, and then even extra credit and like, yeah. So organized, wow, I love it. Yes, yes. Let Thank me jump you. to the other one. And it's really cool that they can use it for math too, because you wouldn't think that students would really use ThinkLink or technology for math, right? But they're able to kind of navigate that and then use ThinkLink to create those additional resources too. So students can just click whenever they want. They can kind of navigate on their own and then create their own projects as well. So educators and students can use it too. Um, Lynn, I was clicking on the quadratic formula one that's on the screen. Mm -hmm. And when you click on it, it looks like the student had added some comments for each of the videos, but is there a way to like expand their comments so you can see like the, the full, the full thing that they have written? Yes. Give me one second. I'm going to jump back to that now. So here's the quadratic formula. And this is very technical, but I just was wondering, because it seems like the student like took time to write a response, but then you can't like, yeah, if you hover there, it's like, yes, I'm a little bit biased. And then it's like dot, dot, dot. Oh. And then there's another one that's above where it seems like when you click on it, it goes straight to the video, but then you can't see what oh, the original. I mean, this part right here, right, Sophie? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not the student's comment. That's the... um caption for the video that was made on YouTube. I thought, but then when I looked it up, it seemed like it was a different caption on YouTube. Let's see, let me click. And then if you if you do it for the other one too, the one that's above the blue one, it seems like. I mean, Wait, it's not this. Easy. Well, maybe never mind. Maybe it's wrong. I I thought when I when I clicked on it, it looked like it was um, yeah, the student was writing. Yeah, because the video one has the um, sorry, it's playing. <laughs> the video one said my algebra is right, so your iPads to create because it says right here, nice animation, right? So it's the student mm -hmm. kind of commenting on that animation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure how to expand it. Let's see. But that might just be playing around with it a little bit more and, and trying to Oh, out. I know why, Sophie, because to see the full thing, you would need to continue with your teacher license. 
Oh, that's how they it's, get you. Okay. <laughs> but it should still be Thank free. You, yes, yes, no problem. Do you guys want a couple more minutes to explore Thing Link? Are, are you ready? Okay, maybe like another three to five minutes. And let me know if you have any questions. It's so interesting. I came across like I'm a like I'm the librarian, but I came across the October Dare to Read, and like now there's like all these cool um book trailers and things. So wow, this is opens up a whole new world. Um, very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, can I guess you, you could use that and then put like the trailer link onto that document, and students can just hover over it to watch it. Question. Yeah. Is um, minutes, like, can you tell? Um, Tell us like the biggest difference between the paid versus the unpaid version. Yes. Um, so the, I think the paid version allows you to have access to absolutely everything. So if we go back to the main thing link page. And click create. There are some features that if you don't have uh, some features here that if you don't have your teacher's license, it might not be able to let you access that right away. So you would have to insert your credentials into it. But for the general functions, you can still use it without the teacher license. Any other questions about ThingLink? Maybe another like two to three minutes kind of just looking through everything on there. Um, I, I don't have any more questions. Um, would you be able to like click around um, for those who are watching the recordings to show them kind of um, like some of your favorites, I guess? I don't know. Um, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. So here is. Wow. I actually really like this one. This is the tornado one that we were looking at earlier. Oh, thank you so much. So that's cool. Yeah, inserting comments, videos. Well, this one doesn't have too much videos, but. Instead of, I guess, writing everything onto their project, they can have just more buttons. So it's more interactive and then not all the information is just right there presented all at once, but students can just click through the section that they want to go to. Websites. So that kind of ties in with what you were talking about earlier too, Ms. Oshiro. Like you can put the trailer, the links to them, students can go and explore on their own. So it almost is like a database in a sense where students can get all the information that they need for that one particular topic, whatever's presented. That's okay. so awesome. Yeah, what a, what a fun interactive um, uh, voice and choice for the students to be able to explore what they're interested in, but keeping them on topic. I love that. And same thing here too. So really you can use it for any subjects. You can put links in there, pictures, images, even there's no example of this on this website, but you can also put in um, like surveys and polls too. So now I'll jump back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So the last part of this is just the benefits to students. So for student outcomes, um, virtual learning allows for more effective communication between the students and teachers or educators, as well as students and their peers, parents, and their teachers. So all of the components that are vital to students' academic success. And then in terms of online resources, there it's creating a space for students to have a, their own voice in their learning, it empowers students to take responsibility of their learning through feedback on lessons, and they can participate in projects and learning activities that gives them the opportunity and the chance to better understand and learn how to not only use technology effectively and creativity, 
or creatively, but also to kind of take accountability for their own progress, for their own kind of like timeline, their own time management. And students are able to enable, promote, and facilitate more student-teacher collaboration, student-student -student collaboration, and even student-parent collaboration, which is not listed here. But in terms of like the progress tracking tools, for these different sites, you can also share the information with the parents if it's an individual. So the parent would not be able to see all the lists of the students and their grades, but for each individual student, you can also share their grade with the parent via this online tracking tool as well, which is really nice. So any questions so far about student outcomes? And then this is time to get hands on with the resources, but we already kind of put some time aside for that. So I just wanted to say thank you for giving me the time and space to present today. And then um, I guess now any questions that you folks might have? Um, <clears throat> so I know that this was one of the things that you had addressed in the beginning with like your list of pros and cons. Um, but I found that sometimes when I try to do technology things in the classroom or like have them like, you know, create a slideshow or something like that, um, because our school, like all the students have different computers or, you know, iPads or um, different programs that you also have to kind of like build in how to use the technology or how to use the platform. Um, so out of the the ones that you have, which ones do you feel like are the most user friendly? Um, so are you talking about this portion, Sophie? Yeah, like well, all of all of the um, platforms that you kind of shared for the students to use. So like um the whiteboard and camera and thing link and stuff like which ones do you think or which ones would you recommend are are the most user friendly i think jamboard would definitely be the most user friendly because all that you need for that platform is um, a google account and then some student emails are linked to google so then they can access that as well so that's really good ThingLink is an online platform. So as long as the students are able to connect to the internet, that's fine too. So all of these things I think is pretty user-friendly with the progress tracking tools. This might be a little more trickier, but the students don't really have access to this. It's more of the teacher who's kind of navigating the different functions on these programs. Um, is ThingLink one that the students can collaborate onto as well? Like it's like through their Google accounts? Yes. Yeah, so students can work on like if, for example, if we look at the tornado thing again, different students can jump on there and work on it at the same time if it's a collaborative project. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Lynn. I'll um, wrap it up then. Uh, mahalo to Lynn and for everyone's participation. We hope that you found this session helpful and made some valuable connections. Special thanks again to our sponsors, Sacred Hearts Academy Honolulu and the Augustine Educational Foundation for making this conference free for the past 10 years. Um, please help us by com completing this survey on the website, iteach808.com, so we can continue to receive grant funding. I will put that in the chat there. Um, and you will also receive a certificate of participation after completing the survey and automatically be entered to win one of 10 $10 Target gift cards if you complete the survey by February 4th. The survey will also be sent out to the email address that you registered with. Please make sure to check your spam folder for any emails from iteach 808 at gmail.com. Thank you for being here today and have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Shiro. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you.